<laughs> all righty. Well, praise the Lord. Open your Bibles. We'll just jump right in, all right? Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, and uh, we'll get started this evening. Uh, pastor asked me to teach this Wednesday and next Wednesday, so uh, we're going to probably have part two and part part one and part two uh, in in the next week or so. Uh, the reason being that uh, I know we're, we're a little pushed for time tonight uh, because we got started so late, and like, as I said <laughs> in the opening, that's kind of my fault <laughs> because I was running so late. It took a while to get everything set up, but anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, glad we're all here. <laughs> Amen. And uh, what we're going to look at is, if you had to title it, get an overall title for everything, we're going to talk about the confidence we have in faith. The confidence we have in faith. And that word confidence is the key to it. And so we're going to begin reading here to get some, some background and to get some uh, context to what we're talking about. But then we're going to concentrate on the scripture here in 1 John 3. So uh, let's pray and then we'll, we'll get right into the scripture here. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and to minister the Word of God. And Father, I thank you that as we study the Word tonight, the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church, has free reign, free access to us, to our spirits, to our minds, to renew our minds to the Word of God. Father, we just thank you for that privilege that we have to be taught the Word by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as a teacher, I rely on the anointing of the teacher. Uh, there are there are fivefold areas of ministry, and uh, pastor, teacher, prophet, uh, apostle, evangelist. All right, and the thing about it is the teaching ministry. Uh, a lot of times, people look at Bible teachers as like, oh yes, yeah, Sunday school teachers, or you know, somebody that teaches in the regular school system uh, would make a good Bible teacher. No, it really is an anointing. It's an area that is called an anointing of God. And a lot of people kind of look down on Bible teaching as, well, it's not as spectacular as the apostle. It's not as spectacular as the evangelist. But I really relish the teaching ministry. I enjoy getting into the Word of God. I dig in there, and like Jerry Savelle said, it's like getting nuggets of truth. You know, the deeper you dig, the more you get down to that gold, that vein of gold, where you can really get into some exciting stuff. And so that's what I want to do as we get into this tonight. 1 John 3.11, For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now as believers, we know that God is love, and we are to walk in love, and we are to be children of love, in effect. Our children of God, children of love. So we are to walk in love, that, and we should love one another. Now he goes on to say, I think this is really interesting, in uh, verse, 11, uh, verse 12, I'm sorry, Not as Cain. Now, he draws this comparison here. He says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, that would be the devil, and slew his brother. Well, that's a pretty extreme case of not loving, okay? <laughs> okay, that's for sure. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. And, of course, we know from our study throughout the Word of God about Cain and Abel here, the reason that Cain did not receive the favor from God that he could have received is because when he tithed, he did not tithe in blood. This goes back to blood covenant, all the teaching concerning blood covenant. He did not go to his brother and take his crop of, you know, vegetables or whatever else he was growing and trade with him to get a lamb that he could use as a sacrifice. God was very explicit that the sacrifice was to be an animal, was to be a lamb. All right, and that carries down from a perspective of, of teaching the word, that carries down to Jesus being the lamb that was slain. All right, and the blood covenant is shown through that. Well, you don't, you can't slay a vegetable. <laughs> okay, maybe you can try, and maybe a tomato might bleed a little, <laughs> but it's not blood, <laughs> it's tomato juice. So, when Cain approached God and tried to tithe of his uh, crop of plants, that was not in line with what God wanted him to do. And because of that, God did not show favor to him. 
but to his brother who did it correctly. He had a lamb. He sacrificed as he was supposed to. He obeyed the scripture in how to sacrifice to God, and God was pleased with that. So here, John says, because his own works were evil, talking about Cain, and his brothers were righteous, or within right standing to God. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Now, it would seem almost that he's changing gears here, but he's not. The reason the world hates us as believers is because they are doing works on unrighteousness. We are operating in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not that we're doing good and so therefore they hate us, but because we represent good. We represent God. All right? Now, here I'm going to, I'm going to take a little side trail just for a second. Uh, if you are on Facebook at all, <laughs> you see a lot of weird stuff, okay? And some of the things that I see, I don't see a lot of regular news. You know, I don't sit around and watch TV news all the time. Good thing, because most of the time what it says is completely off base. But at any rate, the only kind of news I get regularly is tends to be from Facebook, and not because I'm looking for it, because it just scrolls by on my screen, you know. And I'll see things, and I go, really? And I'll have to go then do a little research when I find something of interest. And one of the things that I've seen in my stream of late is how much Islam is coming to the forefront in our political system. There are uh, uh, Muslims who are, uh, have gotten elected, they're in Congress, and so forth and so on. All right, well, they are doing what they believe for, based on the Quran. The Quran is their scriptures. So they're doing their scriptures, okay? But if you go look at what their scriptures say, it says that you're to kill the infidel. It says you are to lie if necessary, to put forth Islam into a political system, that you are to, uh, uh, whatever you do, you're supposed to set up Sharia law. And so you've got to get rid of the current legal system and substitute it with Sharia. And the crazy thing is, a lot of politicians, because they don't want to be labeled Islamophobic, they don't want to be seen as coming out against what they perceive, let me say this carefully, what they perceive to be a... Uh, a minority that has been, uh, you know, uh, people have come against them because of their religious beliefs, and so they're trying to be big in themselves and say, well, we're going to, to help the little guy here. We're going to help the uh, Muslims because they've been so downtrodden through the years, and they come across with this idea that, well, you know, we're supposed to accommodate them. We're supposed to... You may notice there are schools that are letting kids bow to the East in Islamic prayer, but they would never let them pray a Christian prayer in school. That's crazy. But again, the political system is doing it in order to say to themselves, we're tolerant. But you notice the tolerance only goes so far as the system that is in place because of the devil. If you check out what Islamic teaching says, their God is not our God, all right? Their God is, is some weird demonic moon God, all right? It has nothing to do with our God. And so when they say Allah, they're not talking about Jehovah. <laughs> they're not talking about I am that I am. A whole different person <laughs> behind it, okay? And Allah, if you really want to name who he is, is the devil, all right? Now, a lot of people say, oh, how dare you say that? You must be Islamophobic. No, Islamophobic means I'm afraid of Islam. Mm -hmm. Right? You take Islam, you take phobia, which is fear, fear of Islam. I'm not afraid of Islam. I despise Islam, <laughs> but I'm not afraid of it. Now, people say, oh, but, but you shouldn't despise them. I don't despise the people. I despise the doctrine, yes. see, the teaching, because it is taking those people that I love to hell. Okay, 
I mean, for me to operate in love doesn't mean that I forgive them and, and excuse them and say, yeah, you go ahead and practice your Islamic teaching. No, I need to teach them the truth. Amen. I need to stand up and preach the gospel, yes. the good news of Jesus Christ, because their teaching, their doctrine will take them to hell. And if it's like, you know, the old story of the guy who's, you know, there's a guy out there and he's waving people down trying to get them to stop. And people are just whizzing by him. Please, please stop. Well, there's a bridge out down the road. People that are ignoring him don't know it. But he's doing the best he can to try to get them from going off that bridge into the, you know, five stories deep river <laughs> below them. So he is operating in love. Now, a lot of people, by today's standards, would say, well, to truly operate love, you should stand there and say, you go on by, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. That's not love, that's crazy. That's nuts. So if I see something like this evil, demonic teaching, I'm going to stand up and say, sorry, no. Now, do you legally have every right to believe it in the United States of America? Absolutely. And I will stand up for your right to believe it. But you give me a chance, I'm going to tell you that it's of the devil. And that doesn't mean I don't love them. That doesn't mean that I'm Islamophobic. It simply means that I'm trying to be the guy waving them down before they go off the bridge. All right? So why say all that? Because the world, in this case, those that are preaching and teaching Islamic doctrine who are in Congress and all these things, have positions of power, the world is doing things that are not righteous, that are not in right standing with God. Islamic teaching is not in right standing with God. Okay? So, it is no wonder that they hate us. Now, literally, as I said, in, the, in their scriptures, their Quran, it says they're to kill us. If we won't convert, then, by George... We're going to take your head. That's not extremism. That's what they teach. That's what you literally read in the book. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's no, no wonder they hate us. They're teaching false doctrine. So, don't be amazed and don't be, uh, you know, so concerned that, oh my goodness, how could they hate us so much? Because they're motivated of demonic forces. And now, what we have to do is we have to have confidence in the Scripture. Because this is where this confidence in faith that I'm talking about comes in. We need to have confidence in God. We need to have confidence in His Word. We need to have such confidence that we can stand up before the world and say, no, that teaching is wrong. No, that will take you to hell. And when they say, you're not operating in love, you can say with confidence, yes, I am. Amen. Because if you continue down the road you're going, you're going to die, you're going to go to hell. That's just the way it is. Now, you can, you can beat me up over that, you know, maybe physically, but I'll still be saying, sorry, the Scripture says. I'm going to have conf confidence in the Scripture. I'm going to have confidence in God. I'm going to have confidence in what I have learned. Now, that even follows when it comes to our fight to receive our healing, for instance. You have to have confidence in His Word that by His stripes we were healed. If we were, then we are. Jesus bore my sicknesses. He carried my diseases. If He bore them, I don't have to bear them. Matter of fact, for me to bear them means it would be a miscarriage of justice because He's already borne them for me. Now, I have to have confidence in that. When I was in the hospital and I was laying there in bed and couldn't lift my hands, couldn't lift my feet, couldn't move, could only say yes or no with my thumb, and I'm laying there, the doctor comes in and says, you got a week to live. I had a choice. My choice was, well, I can lay back and take it easy and go to heaven. And it wouldn't take long, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's only a week. All I had to do was lay there one more week. And I was out of there. Or... I could have confidence in what I have been taught. I can have confidence in the Word of God. I can have confidence in the Word of Faith. I've had 35 plus years of teaching of the Word of Faith. And that teaching rose up inside me. 
and gave me confidence to boldly say to that doctor, I'm sorry, I won't be dead in a week. Send me home, I'll live and not die. And he just shook his head. Poor boy. Matter of fact, they tried to give me, they came in one day, this doctor comes in, you got to watch these guys, okay? Got to watch them because, you know, if you're laying there in the hospital and you can't really do much anyway, and they come in and say, here, take this, your natural response is to say, sure, okay, I'll take, you're the doctor, you know what you're doing. Well, he came in with a pill one day, he says, here, take this. I said, uh, what is it? He said, it's, and he, you know, gave his medical gibberish or what it was. And I said, what does it do? He said, well, it's an antidepressant. I said, an antidepressant? Why, do you, why are you giving me an antidepressant? Well, you only have a week to live. Like that made sense. <laughs> you know? Well, of course. We got to give you an antidepressant. You only got a week to live. Uh, no, I'm not depressed. Uh, Mr. Bailey, you do understand you only have a week to live. You ain't leaving here, except in a box. I mean, he was straight with me. <laughs> I said, that still doesn't mean I'm depressed. Why would you think I'm depressed? He looked at me kind of funny. I said, and see, this is the thing. Now, I didn't say this in words, but in, it, it, this was coming out of my heart. I have confidence in the Word of God. Either way, I was winning. Okay? If I'd have gone home to be with the Lord, which is far better... Paul told us that, and he's far better, then I win. But that was not my plan. Okay. Death is the last enemy to be conquered. You won't see me laying down and accepting death. And that's what hospice teaching is all about. Just accept death. It's a natural part of life. Just lay on down and go home. You know, you've made your peace with God. Pat your little hand. You've made your peace with God. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm in a hurry. Yeah. Amen. You know, I got things to do. <laughs> I teach the Word of God. I, I'm on radio and TV. I got things to say. I got things to do. Yes. And I have confidence in what I've been taught. So I said, look, just send me home. I know you won't be... I mean, they told me we got to send you home because we need the bed. <laughs> we need the bed for somebody we can help. We can't help you. Now, I'll give the guy credit. He was honest. He told me the truth. But I said, okay, tell you what, just send me home. It'll be fine. Well, we're putting you under hospice care. Don't, don't do that. Don't send anybody by to pat my hand. Don't give me any drugs to put me out where I don't know who I am or where I am. Because, see, I'd, I'd seen this with my mom. Now, you know, she was, she was fighting a lot of stuff, and she got to the point that, that she couldn't physically eat. And, you know, if you can't physically eat, you're not long for this earth. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. But she couldn't eat because her throat had closed up and her body was just shutting down. And they had her under hospice care. Well, they kept giving her drugs. She didn't know where she was, when she was. Now, you know, she was, she was also had all, Alzheimer's, so there was crazy things going on in her life. She saw cows going through her room. And she'd ask me, did you see that cow? And I'd go, no. <laughs> well, you got to stop it. It'll be in the kitchen here in a minute. And she said, oh, and by the way, did you get that little boy out of the, the stove? I said, no, I didn't. Well, you need to go get him out of the stove. And I mean, this is all stuff to her was very real. Yeah. And, you know, finally it got to the point. This was, this was funny, funny and sad at the same time to me, is that Ben, who is now 26 at that time, I guess he was probably 22 or so, Ben, she saw him as me. She called him Bill. And so she would, she, when I wasn't around, she would call Belinda over and say, Belinda, come here. Who's that old man that lives here? <laughs> she said, what old man? That old man with a beard that lives here. She said, that's Bill. No, I saw Bill earlier today. <laughs> he doesn't have a beard. <laughs> Which at the time, Ben didn't have a beard. And so... Uh, Belinda would say, well, that's Ben. You remember Ben, your grandson? Really? <laughs> really? And so during her last days, she didn't know who I was. You know, I was that old man that lived there.
But the crazy thing was, they weren't helping her mental clarity because they were giving her all these drugs that were putting her out. So I, I knew in advance, no, don't take the drugs. Because I need my mind clear to confess the Word, to speak the Word, to operate on the Word, again, to have confidence in the Word. If I'm a space cadet, I can't be standing in faith. That's right. Amen? So, you know, if I'm sitting there going, whoa, look, flowers. I mean, <laughs> you know, I need to be in the Word. I need to be serious. I need to get down with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's what I did. So... When the world, like those doctors, when they looked at me like, you a little squirrely, <laughs> you know, I don't know what to make of you. Well, the thing is, I'm here. Yeah. And I'm strong. That's been two years ago. And the doctors, <laughs> to this day, don't know what's going on with me. I would hit to see my doctor. And she said, you know, based on everything I saw from the, from the hospital, your, your liver should be, it should be shutting down. I mean, it's in bad shape. The numbers are never going to be right. They, they said it was terminal you know well I was believing my confession was this is a real rabbit trail here but that's okay my confession was every cell and every organ of my body functions perfectly as God designed it to function well that included my liver so I went out this has been a year ago I went out to the ICFM convention in Fort Worth Texas at uh, International Eagle Mountain International Church and I'm out there and I'm sitting out in the uh, auditorium and Brother Copeland's up there preaching Prophet of God's up there preaching. He stopped right in the middle of what he was teaching and said, somebody here just got healed. Uh, their liver has been healed. Well, I jumped up out of my chair. I took my hand and I grabbed the air. I said, I'm taking it. That's me. Now, there's a lot of people around me kind of looked at me like, you're taking it? Well, Gloria Copeland said that's what the word means there where it says, receive it means to take so what did I do in confidence this is what we're talking about in confidence I took it and I took it and I said that's mine so then after the service now did I feel anything no did I glow no did I feel any warm syrupy honey no nothing but after the service I went back to the reception they had for the ministers there. And I was one of the members, one of the ministers. I went into the little room that they had, and they had all these chairs and tables set up, and the tables were round, and everybody was sitting around all the tables. And I went from table to table. I didn't even know these people. You know, Most of them didn't know them. And I would go to a table, i say, I got my healing tonight. My liver is healed. They would go, well, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> Whoever you are, you know. And I'd go to the next table. I received my healing tonight. I took it. It's mine. Well, that's good, brother. <laughs> so then I got to the table where uh, Dr. Doug Wingett was. Of course, I know Doug. I know him very well. And I walked over. I said, Brother Wingett, I received my healing tonight. My liver is healed. I took it. It's mine. He said, Glory to God, Brother Bill. I agree with you. <laughs> and he got as excited as I was. And I went around, I told Dr. Larry Allison, president of ICFM, I came up and says, Dr. Allison, I, I'm healed. I received my healing. It's mine. I took it. He said, amen, Brother Bill. I believe it, <laughs> you know. And so I didn't even think any more about it. Went home. Months went by. Months and months went by. I go to my doctor. Doctor says, I want you to get the blood test. So I go take, get a blood test. I had, I had like four different tubes they filled up with blood. I said, you guys trying to drain me? What's going on here? Well, she ordered all this stuff. Okay. So I go to my doctor. My doctor sends me this note electronically. You know, they've got all these cool systems where you can check on the web now. And I go on and she sends me a message. says, oh, Mr. Bailey, I need to talk to you about your numbers. I went, okay, hallelujah, I'm healed <laughs> by the stripes of Jesus, glory to God. Because, you know, she says something like that. You kind of go, talk to you about your numbers. And they'd already told me in the hospital my numbers were going to be wrong. From then on, you know, so I said, cool, I'm cool. Every cell, every organ of my body functions perfectly just as God designed it to function. That's where I have my confidence. So I go in and she says, pull up a chair. I pull up a chair. And she's a character. She is really a character. If you ever get to go see Dr. Door for whatever reason, you will see very quickly that she's a little bit nutty. But anyway, she pulled me in. She said, scoot up here behind me in front of her computer and I was like okay so I scooted my chair over and she said look at these numbers 
I looked at them, I said, okay. <laughs> they could have been A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. They're just numbers to me, you know. Said, okay, what am I looking at? She said, these numbers are perfect. Every single one is perfect. I don't understand it. In the hospital, they said these numbers would never be right. They were all over the place. Your liver is perfectly healed. She used the term healed. She said, well. She said, your, your liver is perfectly well. And I went, well, glory to God. And she said, okay. <laughs> Whatever. And then she went on with the rest of the appointment and everything. But I couldn't, I couldn't help but think about it. I reached out and took my healing. Now, you know, the, the crazy thing about my liver, while I was in the hospital, my liver, since it wasn't working the way it was supposed to, my abdomen was filling up with fluid. And it would fill up and fill up and fill up. It looked like I was pregnant, you know, with this big bunch of fluid. And then they would, they would take me and they'd do what they call paracentesis. They would stick a needle in there and they would drain the fluid out. And it would go into this receptacle and it, they'd measure how many liters they got out of you. They got like 60 liters out of me. That's a lot of fluid. And the crazy thing is, every time they stick that needle in, it's kind of one of these, they use ultrasound to guide it, but it's one of these, we sure hope we don't hit your intestines, because if we do, and what's in your intestines gets into your system, you'll go septic and die. So we're going we're gonna to be careful with this. I'm like, okay, hallelujah. <laughs> I believe that the Lord will direct your hands. <laughs> so they'd go in there, and they'd stick it in, and they'd, they'd do the paracentesis. Well... After a while, I kind of got to where that was what you did. You know, every two weeks, you go in and you have fluid taken out. And they take out all this fluid. So one of the last things I asked my doctor was, how often do I need to have paracentesis? He said, well, you can go by how much fluid is on your gut, uh, but it'll be roughly every two weeks like you've been doing. Well, I got home. I never had to have paracentesis again. Not once. In two years, I haven't had to have paracetesis. And there's no fluid on my gut because my liver is working correctly now. There's no reason for any fluid to build up. So again, you have to have confidence in the Scriptures. You have to have confidence in the Word of God. All right, we're about out of time, but let's keep going here for just a few minutes. Uh, we know that we have passed, this is verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer shall uh, hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion, from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My children, let us love in word, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, if our heart, which is our human spirit, condemn us not, then have we, this is what I've been shooting for, confidence toward God. Now this word confidence. I tell you, I love it when I do Greek study because sometimes things just jump out at me, and this is no exception. This word confidence is a Greek word. If I could get my computer to <laughs> work with me here. Come on. Well, it's not, it's not coming up for whatever reason. But this word confidence is a word that means not just confidence like having confidence in yourself, being strong in confidence. It means confidence in your confession. Confidence in your confession. And I love that because if you read it, confidence toward God, you don't understand that he's talking about confidence in your words, confidence in what you're saying. When I reached out and said, I take it, I had confidence. Now see, Joe Christian, you know, Joe, Southern Baptist Christian. <laughs> That's the way I was raised. Southern Baptist, all right. So, most of them would say, 
Oh, I dare not say, I'm taking my healing. I mean, if God sees fit some way, somehow, by hook or crook, one way or another, if God sees fit, he can heal me. But if not, well, that's his will, and I'll just do whatever. I'll just, what, if I die, then I just die. Because after all, if God takes a notion, he can see that whole thing. Where's the confidence in that? There's no confidence. It's kind of like if God takes a notion... But I don't know if he ever will. There's no confidence there. Have you ever noticed that superheroes... <laughs> I love superhero movies. I'm a fan of Superman and Green Lantern and Green Arrow and all these superheroes. All right. Been reading comic books my whole life. And a lot of the new superhero movies I love. And I'm going to see Avengers Endgame. Hallelujah. Done got my tickets to the advanced showing. But at any rate, <laughs> have you ever noticed none of them... Stand back and go, well, we'll do the best we can against Thanos, but you know, he's a big dude. He's really strong, and he's got that infinity gauntlet that he can snap his fingers and do anything. I mean, I don't know. No, it doesn't matter. <sighs> Captain America, who doesn't have much in the way of superpowers. Now, he can, you know, he's got some strength and all that, some speed, but not like the Flash, not like Superman. He's just strong, okay? He, he goes up against Thanos and he's trying to beat the boy. And this Thanos is looking at him like, you're a little off. <laughs> because there's no way. He takes his finger and goes, ding, and, and throws him across the room. But you notice Captain America is not standing back going, I don't know, I better not try. Because after all, he's a big dude. <laughs> he has confidence. Yes. Now I'm going to say something right here. Heroes... Have confidence. And heroes of faith have confidence. If you go look at the list of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, and you check up on every one of them, they may have started with a lack of confidence. They may have started being a little mealy-mouthed. But ultimately, when God finally showed them what they needed to do and they got a hold of the Word, they had confidence. They had strength of will. And see, there is absolutely nothing wrong with reaching out and saying, I take my healing. Because that's what we're supposed to do. And the people who didn't reach out and take it, who stood back and said, I'm just going to do the best I can, they're the ones that died. Okay? No, that's harsh, Dr. Bill. You shouldn't be saying that. Dude, I've been there. I absolutely know. Beyond a shadow of doubt, I could have laid back and just let her go. And you know, Praise the Lord. That would have been fine from my perspective. It wouldn't have been fine from Belinda's perspective. It wouldn't have been fine from Ben's perspective. Here's Ben who hates hospitals with a passion, does not like to come there. He's coming there like every other day to see his dad and thinking this may be the last time. Think about that. That's rough on a boy, even though he was 20-some years old at the time. That's rough. Here's a guy he's looked up to his whole life and he could be gone. And I just would say, not me. I'm not leaving this place. And then I look around at all the work I got to do in the ministry. Dude, I got work to do from here on. I'm not going to lay down and leave early. I'm here for a purpose. God's got me doing some things. And so I said, no, devil, you're not winning in this case. I'm going to get up and have confidence. I'm going to be one of the heroes of faith. And, oh, Dr. Bill, that's awful. That's awful presumptuous of you. No, it's not presumption. It's faith. <laughs> Amen? That's what faith is. It's saying what you intend to come to pass. So can I be a hero of faith? Praise the Lord, I can be a hero of faith. I could be listed there in Hebrews 11. You know, the list never did stop. He just gave some examples from the list. There's a long list of believers that are heroes of faith. Some of my personal heroes are heroes of faith. People like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle. I tell you what, I listen to when they teach and talk about their exploits. Uh, Jerry Savelle will tell you, he likes to do faith exploits. Exploits like a hero. And he's ever been a superhero, as is Brother Hagin, as is Brother Copeland. Super in the sense of beyond the natural. Amen? That's what a superhero is. Beyond the natural. Well, I live beyond the natural. I live in the supernatural. 
how to leave. Now next week we'll get into more of this about confidence and how we need to operate in confidence. But I just wanted to whet your appetite this, for tonight and let you know that we're going to be getting into some of these things. And we just don't let yourself feel like, well, I'm trying to be more and do more than I should because I'm making these confessions so strong. Make them. Be strong. Be confident. That's what God wants us to do. And I tell you what, it will ultimately be a blessing to you and to people around you. There's people that still, to this day, come up to me and say, Oh, Dr. Bill, I heard about what happened to you and how you were in the hospital and how you got out and you're healed supernaturally. Wow, that's impressive. Well, see, I told the devil the whole time, Dude, you just building me a testimony. You know, same thing with Pastor, with his toe. When he tells that toe story, <laughs> you know, Brother Hagin has certain stories he told, and every time he'd tell them, I'd say, well, that he's doing that story. He's doing the other story. Well, Brother, <laughs> well, Pastor will start telling the toe story, and I'll go, he's telling the toe story. And I'll go, yeah, amen. And I feel like it's my toe. You know what I'm saying? Because I can sense, I can feel, I can fully comprehend where he came from what he was going through in the natural to come out on the other side with his toe healed and whole. And he doesn't take you know, a, a credit in and of himself. He points it to the Lord. But he had to stand there and be one of those heroes of faith. And it's the same with everybody else that's received anything from the Lord, whether it's healing, whether it is uh, financial deliverance, whether it is uh, social status or whatever, that you, you feel like, oh, well, they're all oppressing me, they're all out to give me. Turn your attitude around. Be one of those with confidence. Be one of those that stand there and says, if God be for me, nobody can be against me successfully. Glory to God. And stand there and be that hero of faith. That's what we need to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Trust you did as well. For those of you that are watching belatedly on the internet, <laughs> then just remember that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Amen. Amen.